Airing first on Asheville FM, WSFMLP 103.3 in Asheville, North Carolina, this is The Final Straw, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian broadcast and podcast emanating out of occupied Jalagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices from struggles for liberation from all around the world. Welcome. This week on The Final Straw, we spoke with Vassil and Maria two Belarusian anarchists living abroad about the aftermath of the 2020 uprising in their country of birth, lessons learned, the current political prisoners, and the Lukashenko regime's attempts to attack the dissidents abroad. Maria is also a member of Belarus Anarchist Black Cross, which does anti-repression education and prisoner and legal support for anarchists in or from that country. More on that group and these topics can be found at abcbelarus.org, including a form to send letters to prisoners in Belarus from the website, and a link to a brand new fundraising campaign to help BABC to support their anti-repression efforts. Check it out at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org and spread it around, including links to all their social media. You can find a transcript of this conversation online in about a week at tfsr.wtf slash zines. To support our transcription, you can send us moolah via the links at tfsr.wtf slash support, or subscribe to our Patreon at patreon.com slash tfsr. But before the interview, here are a few announcements. Anti-fascist and anarchist prisoner Eric King has had his trial pushed back to October 14th at 9.30 a.m. If you can show up to court with an ID and your dapper court wear, you can show up to the Alfred A. Araj Federal Courthouse in Denver to show Eric some support and that he's not alone. For a good read, check out the recent article by Vice about the allegations from Eric's legal team that the BOP deleted video of the incident in question in order to cover up his setup and torture. The annual American Renaissance Conference, or AMREN, a gathering of vile ethno-nationalist hucksters, is slated to occur in Montgomery Bell Park at the Inn and Conference Center, outside of Burns, Tennessee, from Friday, November 12th to the 14th. Opposition is being organized from all over, and you can participate with your crew. For a good intro to what's expected this year, check out the link in our show notes or visit the calendar at onepeoplesproject.com. Would you please introduce yourselves to the audience with whatever names, gender pronouns, locations, affiliation, or other info that could be useful for this conversation? I might go first. I'm Maria. I go by she, her pronouns, and I am speaking on behalf of the Anarchist Black Cross Belarus chapter here. So uh, I can't expose my location at the moment, but uh, at the moment I'm outside of the country. And my name is Vasily, an activist from Belarus who is not in Belarus right now. He, him, and I'm involved in some anarchist organized organiza- anarchist organizations from Belarus. Yeah. And Maria, could you tell us a little bit about Anarchist Black Cross Belarus, the kind of work that you all do and uh, some of some of your history? Right. The like Anarchist Black Cross Belarus started I think around 2009 in Minsk, which is the capital. First, it was like rather an informal kind of network of people who would just make random donations, just not really doing anything other than collecting money. And uh, back then, before 2010, when the first wave of repression hit the anarchist movement in Belarus, the group was not really needed because the state didn't look so much at the anarchists as uh, the enemies, let's say. But after 2010, uh, the group uh, was kind of formed anew, and now it has like uh, membership, and uh, it's a collective that uh, has been running since then. And uh, over time, we've evolved into like a stable group, that is doing fundraisers uh, for uh, and supports anarchist and uh, anti-fascist prisoners in Belarus, and sometimes also people who have Belarusian citizenship who have problems uh, in other countries because of their anti-authoritarian activity. We also trying to uh, expand the support not just 
for like from material side or not just provide financial support, but also psychological support. Not not that we are providing that, but we are like uh, open to pay for that or to look for either professionals or like self-help groups and so on, because we see like activist trauma, like post-repression trauma as a, um, like as a consequence of repression that needs to be dealt with, uh, especially also after uh, release from prisons. Yeah, so we're trying to work on that and we're also quite interested and I think we were quite successful in creating a new, let's say, security culture in the movement, like trying to agitate for like not talking to the cops and giving a lot of uh, trainings and seminars, producing brochures about like what expects you once you get caught and uh, what's the best way to behave and also get like showing some light at how the police is preparing themselves like for psychological pressure like what methods they use in order to actually make you speak speak so this is what we have been doing and i think this last year was uh, like a catastrophe <laughs> for the collective because uh, previously we had to deal with like let's say three to six prisoners a year let's say uh, and uh, maybe also on like throughout the years it would be like the same people who would just be uh, in in prison for longer terms but this year at the moment there's already like 26 people who are either you know, behind bars or have already been convicted after the protests and a lot of people had to flee the country and uh, this is also like our comrades that we will we need to help with like migration issues and also like settlement uh, support and stuff like that. So um, yeah, this is why at the moment we like have to like we we have a lot of work and we also need a lot of uh, support uh, from the outside of the country as well. It feels like we can also go back and touch on this in later questions too. But since we are talking about ABC Belarus right now, could you? Th- Tell us of any ways people can find out about your work and any other like international, any sort of like international organizations or momentum that you participate in, like the Week of Solidarity or the Anarchist Defense Fund, like that sort of stuff. Right. I mean, a- ABC Belarus is like part of this uh probably shrinking network of ABC groups here in Europe. We are like, have like some connections to also ABC groups in the US, but not so much. But in general, we try to like participate in any effort of solidarity here in this continent. And um, basically you can find information about the group and also the news uh, on like Belarusian prisoners or like, general repression in the country on our website, which is uh, abcbelarus.org. And uh, we are trying to publish now monthly updates on repression in the country uh, in English. So it's not only about fundraising, but also like you can um, uh, forward or like repost, share messages from there if you have like a English speaking website somewhere. Yeah, so basically that's it. Last year, I spoke with a comrade around November of uh, 2020, about a year ago, about the uprising in Belarus, which had already been going for some months at this point. For listeners who somehow missed it, could one of you give a really brief overview of the uprising, at least up until that point, and just sort of bring us up to date so that we can we can move on from there? Um, so if you missed what was happening in Belarus in 2020, in August, after the elections of the president, one eventually the biggest uprising in the modern history of the country happened with um, first dozens of thousands of people going to the streets and afterwards hundreds of thousands of people uh, going to protest uh, against the dictatorship of Alexander Lukashenko. Uh, This lasted for several months. One of the reasons that actually this whole thing was possible was the coronavirus, but also dissatisfaction with the economical problems of the country and so on. And the protests had uh, different momentums, like in the first days it was really um, intensive and with a lot of clashes with the police and with a lot of repressions and at least several people killed by the uh, police. 
Later on, it transformed in some kind of a peaceful demonstrations, marches every Sunday. However, it, it never managed to grow to the extent that would destroy the governmental power and eventually put end to Lukashenko's rule in the country. Uh, by the end of 2020, most of the protests were over all around the country. Uh, a lot of people were repressed. I think in this four months since August, uh, from August to December, over 30,000 people were prosecuted, 30,000 people in the frame of um, 9.5 million people living in Belarus, which was like a super big amount of people. That means that uh, everybody knew someone who was eventually repressed. Uh, apart from that, over a thousand people were detained and put on like a hold for prosecution. Uh, the 30,000 people were prosecuted through administrative codex, which was like a smaller violation of the public disorder, which would give you like 15 days in prison or fines. And this over a thousand people were um, arrested and are now waiting or were prosecuted or waiting for trial for the criminal offenses, which would be I don't know, one year in prison up to 25 years in prison. Uh, so this the, the protests were crashed. And at some point we thought that maybe the Belarusian government will, you know, go crazy for the next couple of months and will calm down uh, as it was happening normally through the history that if there would be like a protest, there would be some repressions, but then the government would stop. And over one year um, since the protests, the repressions are still going on and people are still getting arrested. The police is still processing the videos and photos that they made during the protests. And they are still like catching the, the protesters and charging them with the more serious actually charges than they were doing in uh, autumn 2020. Also, apart from that, there is a big wave of migration that started with the mass repressions. Um, depending on the country, there are also dozens of thousands of people left, mostly in the direction of Ukraine and Poland, which are the nearest countries. And some parts went to Lithuania and the others went all around the world, basically. But the biggest diasporas right now are concentrated in Ukraine and Poland and trying to organize politically there in any way to undermine the Belarusian government uh, politics in the region. Right. So, and at that point right now, um, most of the political organizing is actually smashed. So all the political organizations were destroyed. Uh, most of the media that is not affiliated with the government is uh, banned or um, got their license revoked. And journalists actually massively left the country because of the... Um, threat of prosecution. The human rights organizations are also um, en masse living the country. And there, there are several human rights defenders, like big ones in the political sphere, who are sitting in prison. And most of also non-governmental um, NGOs not affiliated with the Belarusian government are also getting shut down. And people who were working for those NGOs live in the country to um, go abroad under threat of prosecution as well. Yeah, so everything looks pretty dire. Apart from that, it's also worth mentioning that uh, when we came to the elections in 2020, Lukashenko was quite close to the Western countries, to European Union, but also to US. Um, and he was getting like funding from those countries. But as the protests escalated, and as Lukashenko was making more and more political mistakes, European Union was kind of cornered into reacting to his bullshit. And now um, the regime is under sanctions of European Union and US. And that kind of like forced Lukashenko to search for another allies. And now his main ally is Putin, who well, doesn't care about dead people or blood flowing on the streets as long as you are loyal to him. So Lukashenko's regime is now heavily based on uh, Russian support. And this was happening historically. Um, all in all, Lukashenko managed to survive because uh, Putin or Yeltsin back then were supporting him economically, but also politically on the bigger political arena. Are people going those direction, like to those two countries in particular, because of those countries' current relationship with the Russian regime of Putin? Or is there other reasons? Yeah, I think the reasons are s simple. Just because uh, for Ukraine, you don't need a visa 
So basically you can just get out as quickly as possible, even if you don't have like any documents. Uh, and you can stay there uh, up to 90 days without any reason. And uh, this is what people actually did. And also in Ukraine, people speak Russian and this is like this kind of post-USSR mentality or culture that people are sharing. So basically for those who don't really speak English or other languages, it's the best way to just change the surroundings without actually changing the context, let's say. Also because people are kind of feeling more secure than, for example, go into Russia, because in Russia, Russian and Belarusian authorities and the police uh, have like unified databases of people who are like dissidents, let's say, and they actually can arrest you. And this has been done massively in uh, Moscow and uh, St. Petersburg, where they have face recognition surveillance system in, uh, in the streets. So people do not feel safe in Russia. That's why they flee somewhere else. So for Ukraine, it's like that. Uh, if we speak about Poland, uh, Lithuania, uh, these are the two countries that were the first to react. I think in of October or November, they said they're going to provide any assistance to people who have to flee the country. And they started giving that so-called humanitarian visas. So that's basically a national visa that allows you to stay longer than uh, a tourist visa. And you don't need like grounds, uh, like having to work or um, like some studies and so on. So you can just uh, basically get um, a proof that you ha have been repressed and that you're going to be issued this visa and you can stay in the country and later apply for like a refugee status or a protection status. And um, also because the EU now, I think it's effectively denying the extradition requests from Belarus, even uh, via Interpol. So basically, this is where people feel more safe in terms of like not getting extradited. I think they, these are the easiest options for people to go to. I would like to point as well that although Poland and Lithuania are given these humanitarian visas and they are like openly accepting Belarusian refugees, uh, the other EU countries are not that open, although they're condemning the violation of human rights. It is way more complicated to move to other European Union countries, like going to Germany or going to France, Spain, wherever you want to go, it is quite complicated. So for the people who want to, well, leave Belarus and have like a secure, safe place, um, those are like the easiest places to go, like you uh, in within the European Union, Poland and Lithuania in that case. Yeah. So Lukashenko is still in power. People are still having to go abroad and still organizing resistance against the regime from abroad. If it's, a, this is a, a strange way to put it, but this is like common parlance in the US, at least during English. There was a lot that seemed to come out in the uprising that my understanding and having spoken to a few people from Belarus, there were parts of the movement that seemed kind of unprecedented and sort of unexpected. Like for instance, the running battles with the police the extreme violence that the police and the jails enacted on individuals when they arrested them from sexual assaults to, to like literal torture. I think there were some disappearances of people. There was like the conscious, and this is a thing that police do wherever because they're police to, you know, at different times, but this is exceptionally cruel and concentrated. The apparent attempt to infect as many people with COVID as possible by cramming them into cells in the middle of a pandemic and it seemed like elements of the of the Belarusian nation were chipping away from what had been a sort of toleration of the administration to actually, you know, police quitting their jobs in instances, people targeting where police lived to try to pressure them to leave, workers threatening strikes. Like, this was a massive, massive moment. And I guess the English term that I was going to point to is called a postmortem. What sort of lessons do you take from like what worked, what seemed not to, and and why the administration has continued to be able to stay in power? My idea is that actually this it went the way it was 
supposed to go, let's say. I mean, of course, uh, all, all the things you've mentioned, uh, like the new expressions of like solidarity and new ways of protests and actually like attracting masses of people to the protest was something new. And this like, it was new for all of us and for, for the people also. What I mean that it was supposed to end like this is because the state knows best tactics on how to uh, suppress the protest. Because you have to understand that for many people in Belarus, it was the first time when they were actually politically interested and were trying to promote or like defend their rights or let's say whatever, or protest against anything. So these people have never been detained. These people have never seen an aggressive policeman beating up someone else in the street. These people have never been arrested or like detained at their workplace. These people have never been harassed uh, and threatened with uh, taking their kids out of their family if they're going to uh, continue protest. So these people have never experienced like cunning repressive mechanisms that the state has and like for example for me they are not new because i am uh, in the movement for 15 years and i like many of them have been used against me or against comrades or against like other people just because i'm involved and so many of them didn't work for me but people who went to the street in august and september were at the in the streets as long as it was safe for them like uh, as long as they could just be in the streets think that they're going to change something peacefully and here comes also the question of lacking the political uh, analysis uh, or like the political history of let's say revolutions or like successful protests or coup d'etat so and so on so people like really thought and they believed that they even if they're going to be a lot in the street for some time lukashenko will just leave and this has never happened in in uh, in in history but it was for them it was the first time and they didn't listen to anyone that it should be like okay more offensive let's say but at the same time, uh, there was also no, no one powerful enough in the media who would actually call them to be offensive. Like everybody uh, in the political sphere was speaking about the fucking peaceful protest. And this is why like, this protest was going on, because it was supported and promoted. And so when I was under arrest in October, uh, I had like a few women in my cell who were at their door uh, taking to like a car uh, with a black bag on their head just to be arrested for 15 days. And so like for me, it was clear that the police is just using this as a, as a threatening mechanism. Like before it was really safe. You just go to the protest, you go back, nothing happens. And suddenly you've realized that they know where you live, they come for you and they bring you like as a hostage in, I don't know, Afghan movies or something like that. And they take like a uh, thousand people like that and these thousand people is telling their neighbors what's what's happening and the neighbors starting to be afraid that it's they are going to be the next. So like for me, I knew that they were using it just for that to intimidate the population and they were like really successful in that so like having this as a picture of like repression or ex like some kind of exemplary cases it worked for people and uh, many people just left the streets as soon as they realized that they can't post pictures of them in the peaceful process on Instagram because now police is looking at the Instagrams and checking out the people. Yeah, so basically people were quite uh, active as long as they felt that they could be supported by others. They, in the first days, like you said, uh, a lot of people quit the state-managed uh, jobs, the police, the national television, and so on and so on, like the uh, athletes uh, who are su supported by the Lukashenko and so, and so on. So as long as people saw it, that everybody else is doing this, they were doing it as well. And they were also like seeing a lot of solidarity coming. But then when they saw that actually nobody else is doing it anymore, and it's just kind of you against the system, 
basically, or you and like crazy people like you who are still uh, brave enough to show. This is when people started realizing that, okay, uh, like I'm just ruining my life because of that. And uh, also the solidarity structures were crashed because uh, uh, special uh, solidarity structures were installed uh, outside of the country to collect like, I think they collected like 8 million wow. bucks for uh, solidar yeah uh, from all businesses and like from individuals so basically they were promising that people are gonna have that if you're gonna be repressed you're gonna just have it uh, for sure if you're gonna be fired you're gonna have like money uh, or uh, salary like in three months or something like that and first it worked but then also like these solidarity structures couldn't actually process so many requests so it ended up like being super slow, like people who were fired would not get support like in two months. And these are people with families, you know, like, and then, of course, everybody's talking about that. They are sharing that, okay, this solidarity is just bullshit. Like uh, I asked for the money, but they are like verifying me for ages. I'm being arrested. I'm asking for the lawyer's fees and they are verifying me for ages. And uh, like my mother needs uh, the money to get uh, the food parcel to the uh, prison today. But the money is going to be <laughs> there after like half a year. So and also like the more people got arrested and put behind bars, the more money they mm -hmm. needed. Right. Also, uh, it's uh, like pe what they did is basically trying to transfer money in cash inside the country and there were specific people who would like process like tons of cash to pay for fines and to pay for law lawyers fees and so on and these people were like uh, persecuted they're now in jail and so that's why when when other people who did the same saw that okay just for helping out others i can get in jail i'm gonna stop doing it you know or like i'm gonna run out of the country so they were like showing some exemplary cases of how something you're doing could ruin your life and people were just thinking okay so when we believed in victory we could do that but now we're like doubting victory and and now we like don't really believe in it anymore so i think this is how it works like this let's say the morale it was destroyed and uh, it was like really effectively destroyed and this is why now people are not like people do not believe that there's going to be at any moment a critical mass in the streets that they can join. Like a lot of people want to join, but they feel like they're alone in this. And I think for me, the the Western politics or like, let's say, Western liberal politics played an important role in the way the protest developed. And it started not in August 2020, but like historically if we look at the development of the liberal opposition in belarus we can see that uh, through the money through like political support western liberal powers can control the narrative inside of the country so if you would have like a really militant opposition leaders in the 90s who would be you know rioting or calling for riots partic participating in like really confrontative demonstrations uh, slowly this narrative changed to a peaceful demonstrations peaceful change of uh, power peaceful 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 and this became like a, a a dogma that it was like not possible to change anymore that it should be always peaceful and when we came to um, 2020 the people who were participating in the protests and people who were like let's say a political leadership of this whole mobilization were still insisting on the peaceful protests for um, the first days but also like afterwards although some of the people had clear understanding of the the, the clear possibilities of of uh, clashes with the police like there were leaks for example of tikhanovska talking to some allies in the smaller towns where they would be talking about like possible clashes and what should be done and so on and so forth but this cannot be publicly done as if you start calling for riots if you start calling for um, like a militant overthrow of the dictatorship then you will have issues with those people who are 
uh, eventually support in you and do not support this kind of narrative as like you know the revolutionary agenda is spreading if you if you start calling for revolution in belarus people start asking like oh we also want changes so what are we going to do and i think for a lot of liberals in in, in west in european union or in us right now this narrative is really dangerous taking into account the coronavirus dissatisfaction and all this stuff and of course, a lot of media that is in opposition to Lukashenko um, is still financed by some grants from European Union or by some uh, foundations that are also not accepting this kind of narrative, this kind of like idea of a revolution happening. No, there could be a peaceful protest and like it was, I don't know when in their heads and that's it. And this played a really important role in during the mobilizations as like a week since the protest started, there was this peaceful march that mobilized hundreds of thousands of people. And this was like a moment of euphoria where we thought, okay, now the whole thing is over. And there were a lot of people who were um, reproducing that narrative. So there were so many people that Lukashenko is like a political corpse, right? And I think like within the maybe a German political uh context he would be gone like this is not what you do in in the, in the democratic country but for dictatorship killing a couple of people sentencing or arresting six thousand people this is not a problem so lukashenko was going on and but people started getting this idea of okay peaceful protest everything is fine we are winning so nothing should be changed we keep on going with this peaceful marches and that was a certain moment of blocking as the bigger crowds started like doing only that just sunday marches and the, the people who were doing the mobilization had the problem that they cannot say to these bigger crowds hey let's go and take over the fucking police station or the city council and stuff like that and this was done because of the financing we had as like an organized anarchist in belarus uh, conversations with the um, like media activists or bloggers who would say we, we need like anarchists we need some radicals who would have call who would call for radical actions but this was already like happening um a month too late or something like that and they started like there were situations where um, anarchist calls for actions would be reproduced by the bigger media channels but this was like too late because the repressions were hitting so hard that there was no mobilizational potential anymore outside of the sunday demonstrations so i think this is the thing that was really important for lukashenko to maintain his power that the liberal thought is incapable of overthrowing dictatorship, not only conceptually, like bringing alternative and saying, hey, this is a great idea. Maybe jeans and bananas are not selling so well anymore, but physically, like they, they cannot call in their liberal ideas for revolution, for revolutionary changes. So liberals became a shadow of the liberal movement of the 19th century that where they were like, fuck yeah, we're going to free the population and so on and so forth. And yeah, so this was like a shit show, shit show that was somehow happening inside of the country, but also happening outside of the country. And I think like what Maria said, people didn't have experience in protests. People didn't have experience with all these repressions. And they were searching a lot from outside as well. Like who can help us? Who can explain this thing happening to us? And who was explaining them uh, things were those like liberal bloggers from Russia or from some other countries that also didn't have any fucking clue, but they would be so convincing that everybody will be like, oh yeah, that person knows what he's talking about or she's talking about and so on. Yeah. Uh, can I add something? Totally. Um, I think also like another part, I'm in two minds about what I'm going to say, but uh, I'm just going to mention it. I think one problem or like um, one obstacle towards this kind of like more radical revolution was also in a way that people didn't know radical methods like they didn't know how to implement them let's say and uh, it's it was the first time people saw like a um, smoke grenade or like uh, tear gas uh, exploding around them or something and uh, I like Basically, people, the biggest like bloggers or like Telegram channels with like uh, massive readership were advertising all the time, clenching hands, like clench hands 
every time you see the police because the police is going to take your um, comrades away and you, you shouldn't let them detain. And so people were trained to just be in a row, clenched hands. And like what I saw in the first days of uh, like a post post election protest, people like would just clench hands in front of the police trying to, I don't know, tear gas them or like uh, shooting them or something like the like, people like really didn't understand it's a it's a different method now and you you don't protect yourself against detention but you like it's it's like a street fight in a way you know like this kind of uh, urban guerrilla guerrilla is not uh, something that people were familiar with and i think those who were they were a minority group like it's people who actually either participated in uh, protest demonstrations in Europe, for example, like football hooligans or some anarchists and uh, maybe people who just saw it in the media before. So they kind of knew how it should look like, but not really uh, what exactly they need to achieve with that. Like what would be the strategy with cops? And I think that that one, that is one thing, like people really didn't understand. They wanted to hold a position but why? Like, they didn't understand. Like, if they wanted to move cops away or, like, to be offensive towards cops, they didn't, like, they just wanted to be in, in one place and that's it. And, of course, that doesn't change anything. Like, okay, it paralyzes the city for some time, but not, like, really moving you towards a uh, coup d'etat. And on, on the other hand, a lot of people, like 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 you mentioned, the bloggers were calling people to kind of go and smash policemen's houses and like uh, I don't know ruin their cars and this what this is what people did like they basically went there with their faces open like uh, disregarding the surveillance cameras disregarding the fact that they were already other cops waiting uh, for them there on the spot because they were expecting attacks. So people were just doing like really stupid things without thinking about any security culture connected to the radical action or direct action. And this is what they like, they needed to know that, but the blogger didn't care. Like they would just call people, do something really stupid or like maybe smart, but uh, you should be smart in all spheres with direct action. And people would just do it uh, because they were, were emotional and then they would put in, be put in jail and then they would realize that there's not actually any solidarity because all the uh, human rights organizations are supporting only the peaceful demonstrators and not uh, uh, recognizing political prisoners, those who have, I don't know, smashed cops' cars or smashed cops' faces. So that was a real uh, kind of contradiction because on the one hand people are getting a lot of information about the fact that they should be more offensive but they were not explained how and uh, they didn't have any support after that so i think that was also like the biggest mistake and uh, a lot of people after this the change of the narrative uh, that vasily was mentioning like this kind of peaceful narrative when it came in a lot of radical groups just left the streets because there was no place for them anymore. Like, uh, because these groups knew they have to be in their neighborhoods. They, they know exactly. Together with people, they know. Like, uh, instead of going and showing your face on Sunday uh, morning in March or something like that. So this audience was kind of lost or it was waiting for some action, you know, like it was waiting for a good moment to step in. And another problem was that at the same time, uh, there was this split between like radical and peaceful and the radical ones or people who just wanted to use them started organizing online in open chats. Like, so they were basically forming chats, calling them like, I want to smash cop cars in the street or whatever. Uh, and like just discussing it online without actually protecting their accounts like so like it was really easy to like identify people behind those accounts and this what was actually what is what cops used so they were like just effectively identified a bunch of uh, participants of these chats and they just punished them or they were just actually like trying to organize actions together and uh, they would detain them uh, in this in this scene you know so basically People uh, who wanted to be radical did like really stupid things, especially and like, of course, 
I mean, anarchists tried to change this narrative, tried to, you know, like explain that you should only do a direct action with a person you like really know, you, you, not just your neighbor you see for the first time or not that person from online. Uh, but anarchists didn't have this kind of wide, um, um, we didn't have this influence. You know, like we couldn't spread the message as wide as possible. So I think that was also something that people saw like, okay, I am peaceful, a peaceful demonstrator. Maybe I would like to use something else or like use another tactic, but I don't know how. I don't know with whom because uh, these connections are not uh, built. You know, like I don't, I have, I know some neighbors who are protesting, but I'm not sure they are up for it, you know. And I see that what happens with people who try, you know, so either they are getting caught by the cops or they are just, I don't know. And then, yeah. But at the same time, why I said I'm in two minds about that, because I don't think that revolutions should be like prepared and people like 1,000, 100,000 people have to like really be good at security culture and direct actions, because usually successful protests happening like everywhere where people are emotional enough, angry enough just to go and smash it. And uh, of course, like in the Arab Spring, people would like, they also didn't know how to do it, but somehow it worked in some cases. So I'm like, what I'm saying is that uh, that was totally an obstacle, but I'm not sure uh, it's, it's, it's a matter of just learning and then it's going to be successful. No. It's fair to note that that the Belarusian state had like 25 to 30 years to figure out now that they came out of nowhere, but they had decades to figure out how to repress public uprisings. And like you all have been saying, if people are sort of just suddenly coming to the like, if they're getting this information pumped at them, these images of what a revolution looks like, you know, or what's acceptable, then um, it seems pretty hard to to expand your imagination past that. I think like what is also important in terms of imagination as well is that internet is not as it used to be. <laughs> and that means that all the regulations that are passed in, um, let's say, US or in some European council or whatever, are actually to regulate internet to prevent terrorism or extremism distribution or whatever shit they have in their hands are affecting what is happening in the other countries and a lot of bloggers and a lot of people with like media power had a uh, fear that if they you know start posting pictures or of burning police cars or they would put how to make molotov cocktails on their channels the channels would be blocked because there are regulations that can be like you know um activated um to block this kind of a terrorist content and this was happening like there were channels there were groups um, all around the internet that were blocked by that uh, and this was like the result of not what we were doing um, in belarus rather that what the legislators were doing outside of the country and this is like a, a fucking circus imagine you know like in uh, Soviet Union invades Finland and then Molotov cocktail distribution is banned by the German state or by some crazy fucker sitting in US and saying like, no, no, this is really bad what you're mixing, like try to stop the Soviets with your bodies and with your mind. Um, and this was what has, what was happening in Belarus a lot. And this was, I, I really find it a really problematic and most probably it will shoot back um, in coming years for sure. The Final Straw is a proud member of the Channel Zero network of anarchist podcasts, and here's a jingle from another member of CZN. The Anarchist. Radio Berlin. From across the pond. So it's the Anarchist Radio Berlin. With audios in English, Spanish, and German. And please, don't mention the war. You can find us at channelzeronetwork.com and aradio-berlin.org. I was hoping to put a pin in the um, the discussion of Telegram and the mass usage of it and the fact that both of you pointed to people's anonymity being compromised in the way that they were organizing because there were people from the uprising after the execute or the, the police killing of Freddie Gray in Baltimore in 
I want to say 2015, in the U.S., there were people, youth, using all Snapchat and Instagram and all these other apps to document what they were doing, and that came back to bite them afterwards. In Hong Kong, people were using a lot of online apps to communicate back and forth. That also, I don't know how much that came back to bite people, but Telegram, you know, and going back to the Arab Spring uprisings, um, YouTube and or Facebook and Twitter were were things that the media at least has pointed to as being important tools for organizing. And Vasily, the point is well taken that the internet is not what it used to be, and all these regulations. But there's also we now have microcomputers in our in our pockets that are often registered to our names and that can track our movements around. And data capture is a really easy thing. And I wonder if you all could talk about like any sort of lessons learned about Telegram in particular as a platform that was used so widely and uh, efforts that people have made once they've seen the danger of that platform in particular being used to organize potentially illegal activities, like what sort of like educational or, or cultural interjections that people have made. I, I think the whole thing is a huge topic with the Telegram, right? Uh, because you can start with um, the person who's, who started Telegram, Durov, right? It's He's like a Russian uh, businessman who went to US, uh, who actually before that started the Vkontakte, which was like an alternative to Facebook for Eastern Europe. And he was selling his app as like the security solution for all the activists, everybody. He, like this was marketing, right? And he was really aggressive. He has money. He was advertising that. And one of his main auditoria is like Eastern Europe to say, oh, I'm I'm so great. I'm going to stop actually um, any work with Russia or with Belarus. I am really together with people for fighting for freedom. And I think people started buying that. And the further you go, the more this narrative is actually getting sold really, how would you say, successfully. And forgetting the fact that Vkontakte for a really long time, under Durov as well, was cooperating with the Russian government in also repressing the anti-Putin movements in Russia. So Durov is not like a, you know, an evangelist of freedom who's going to give voice to everybody, doesn't matter who. And this is um, something that is just a commercial application, which doesn't earn a lot of money to the person who made it. And... Telegram is really hardly connected with the phone number, which is a horrible idea. As in some countries, I think in US, you can still buy um, SIM cards without registration to your passport. Mm -hmm. In Belarus, you can't do that. In Russia, you can't do that. And this is basically like um, you get an ID that is connected with, to your passport, to your ID, to your name, to everything that is attached to that. And this is incredibly horrible thing because it is also something that you can't just drop out it, it's like your whole contact list is connected to that your whole social network is connected to that imagine like facebook is doing that from time to time that you need your password to prove blah 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 but imagine you have to register with the facebook but just sending them your uh, password and sending your phone and all the shit and the phone connected to all the geolocation data and that's what happens with uh, with telegram and that's what happened exactly with telegram during the protests all the phones that were used to register people who were protesting were connected with the, to their ids to their passports um, of course as if you are like a turbo anarchist you you could find a way to register a telegram without uh, using a sim card on your name but uh, but most of the people are not turbo anarchists so most of the people had their like passports already speaking into telegram to get arrested and some people you yeah, had can hide and there is this thing and this thing but at the end of the day there were there dozens of ways to figure out uh, people's IDs and that's what happened and people were prosecuted I mean people are prosecuted for the fucking stupidest shit that can happen like you just you know there is a news of uh, a police officer and when he where he's living and what he did in the last like two months and then the person writes oh this fucking bastard is a swine dog right is a pig dog that's what happened to one of the people I know and he got like two years in in, in uh, like a 
I, I don't know, house arrest or something like that, right? And, and this was connected with the fact that this person couldn't be anonymous to write that that cop is a fucking pig, a pig dog or whatever he wanted to say in his creative mind. Um, so the infrastructure of Telegram played an important role in repressing the, the movement so giving this kind of a platform at the beginning, but also in the long run played an important role for the state to repress people. And I think this is also like a, you know, a poisoned apple that you're like jumping on it and really eager to eat. But then you are ending up with, I don't know, a diarrhea or five years in prison. And as we see right now, what is happening is that Telegram blocked in Russia. So we're not talking about Belarus, just jumping to right now, right now, yesterday, the elections in Russia. Um, Telegram blocked the bot for like this smart voting that the opposition was trying to organize in Russia. Basically, by siding up with the Russian state in repressing this opposition attempts to create some, I don't know, um, system that would give people possibility to vote in a different way than the Putin organizers. Um, so Telegram is already giving their, let's say, open mind to helping repressive apparatus to destroy the efforts in bringing down the dictatorship. And this is going to go further and further. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a huge problem that we are still facing and we have no fucking clue how this will be in the next years for sure people will switch to another app in like three four or five years but right now it still goes on and there are people still getting arrested constantly because of their um, phones connected to their telegram and telegram exposing their phones to police and shit like that yeah Okay, I'll just answer the primary question <laughs> about what people did. Because Vasily didn't mention one other thing, is uh, not only identifying people by their phone, but also trying to break in or like hacking the accounts by mm. just cloning SIM card. Because the authorities have the right to... like. I mean, they don't have the right, but they can. So they basically cloning the SIM card, receiving the SMS with the code, like putting it on their computer. And uh, I don't know, voila, they found an admin of the chat or they found an admin of the channel, of a protest channel. And this is what has been done a lot. And uh, I think, of course, Telegram offers now all layers of whatever security. But the thing is that these layers are not switched on automatically. Like when the person is logging in for the first time, everything is open. And like you need to go like through all smallest details until you're kind of protected. Like if say nothing of the number, but just to switch on this like two factor identification and la 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 la, everything is so it's, it's actually not so easy for the people. And we have to also realize that a lot of elderly people or like people over 40, 50 and so on, they are not so good with apps. Like they can't just go and I don't know, like manage the VPN, whatever, connect it to the Telegram in a way that it always works when the Telegram is on. I don't know, like track their traffic check their IPs, uh, and so on. Like, so basically, you can provide some security with chat Telegram, but you like really need to be like knowledgeable of all this. And, and people didn't. Like, they can't just... It, it's too much for a Belarusian person who does the protest for the first time. Like, they need to learn about the security. They need to learn the facial recognition system of the cameras. They need to know how to speak to cops. Now they need to know how to use Telegram. Like, they're... like. Everything we had to learn like in 10 years of political organizing, they now have to learn like in two months or even, you know, in, in squeeze it. So I think answering your question, what was done? I think there was just some education done by also bigger bloggers or like uh, owners of Telegram channels that were calling people to, I don't know, make the settings less unsafe, let's say. But the problem with Telegram, it didn't solve, like people still use it. And I think one of the reasons why it's popular, because it combines Messenger and the news. So you like really, if you want to read the news feed, it's really easy for you to just change the tab and go and chat with someone. And, and I think all the options like, let's say, Signal or whatever, 
that could be a little bit more secure, they do not offer you this opportunity. So you like, can't really read news on Signal or like Facebook is not at all protected in this way. Like I, I think there were calls on like people using something like Briar or some apps that would be not tracking uh, the IP or like, but they are quite marginal. Like the people yeah. would not, it, it doesn't catch. Like people would still use something that is easy to install, that their friends are using because everybody's communicating to each other, that is easy to create a chat and so on. So I think, yeah, like I said, uh, I agree that this problem has not been solved. I think now just more people know how to make their settings uh, a bit more secure. That's it. But people still continue communicating on Telegram. And I think one of the things they're trying to do now is like spreading bots. So then mm, pretending they're making like secure bots that are not logging anything. But again, like how how can people tr check it? Like if I don't have knowledge, I can't really trust it. I, if, if my friend is not like an IT specialist or whatever, we don't know what the servers are. And there have been already cases when some oppositional structures were gathering some information from people via bots and then this information was hacked uh, and like the cops have like all the numbers and all the users who submitted information and i just wanted to mention that one of the let's say hopes of the protest at the moment is the creation of a bot that is called i think it's called victory bot and it's it has been started by Tikhanovska and by Paul, which is uh, the police, like the runaway uh, police in exile, let's say. So they have created the bot that where you are supposed to register, provide information, including where you're living, like <laughs> basically the actual location, where you work, like what is your profession, uh, in which way you would like to help the revolution, whatever. Like, are you ready to be like more radical or not? And so on. And so basically they say as soon as they get like enough users, they would later use the bot to send instructions. Like, let's say if they collect... 500 people in one uh, factory who are using the bot and are ready to act, they would just send them the instruction to like block the production or something. I mean, but these are promises. Like uh, I think they started the bot in, in May and it's still like, I don't think there's uh, people who are like, enough people to, to, for them to start using it. So um, yeah, um, I think for the moment, this problem has not been solved. I can't imagine what could go wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, the cops already created like a a bot that has this kind of the same name. I think just one letter different, and people mistakenly would go to that like Belarusian oh, yeah. cops yeah, bot, exactly. and they do. would register there, and the data would go to the police, and the police would go and arrest people who just wanted to join the victory bot, but the wrong victory bot. I, I think what I forgot as well is the. The comparison to Hong Kong, and I think for a lot of us, was it, it was kind of a moment of hope that we we knew experience from Hong Kong where people were using Telegram and they were using this kind of chatting quite intensively to organize. For Belarus, it didn't work out at all. Like if we would have a chat with five, ten thousand 10,000 people, this is just a garbage. Like you can't talk to people there. It's just basically like a flow of thought, right? Everybody's just writing what they think, but nobody's reading what, what is going on. And mm -hmm. like, this is a complete chaos. As for going on the streets with Telegram, the internet works when there is internet. You know, this is like a really simple rule. And what Belarusian government was doing is it was fencing basically the, the zone of demonstration and switching off the internet there, like mobile internet and stuff. And this was playing an important role in actually like preventing this, you know, fast communication that um, Telegram or any other like Signal app or other apps can provide and was working pretty well. And people were sometimes quite confused because they were counting on this kind of like a coordination through Telegram. They would end up on the street and they wouldn't have any idea what to do next. Like, okay, we didn't read in Telegram what, what are the next steps. So we are not going to self-organize and do some stuff, stuff. Rather, we are like going to be searching for the internet for the next half an hour somewhere where there is no internet and stuff like that. Yeah, We've talked a bit about 
what repression has looked like with after the fact people being surveilled or having their their prior video like images being put into databases and then they're getting arrested for stuff that they were videoed participating in months before um or joining up on apps like like the victory bot and and um kind of turning themselves in but there are a few instances of the international reach of repression of the Belarusian state that I kind of wanted to point to and see if there are other things, you know, because obviously this is an international concern. This is why I wanted to, and I'm very happy to have you both on, on the phone because we resistance struggles in different countries against repression and against capitalism and, and hierarchies have to be able to learn from each other. And we also have to be able to offer support to each other, have an understanding like there's so many people, as has been mentioned, who have who are now living in exile in Poland or in Ukraine or in other places. So it's not just an issue for Belarus. And the same repressive apparatuses that are used in all these different places, like in Hong Kong or in Belarus, are you know similar. They're controlled from outside. They there's a lot to learn. Anyway, blah blah blah. You get the point. Two examples of the kind of international reach of the Belarusian regime in trying to grab back Belarusian rebels that I can think of that sort of like caught my eye are the the downing of the Ryanair flight over Belarus um, when the plane was forced to land by Belarusian, by the government basically saying that there was a bomb on board, which resulted in the wisping away of Roman Prostasevich, who is a blogger and who ran some of these, edited some of these telegram channels or ran them. And there was also in the recent past, the last couple of months, the attempted arrest of Alexei uh, Bolenkov in Ukraine. I'm wondering if you all could talk about these. They're very different circumstances, but talk about these and like other examples that, that the international audience might want to know about. So the plane story was uh, one of the major mistakes of Lukashenko. And what happened there was that uh, Protasevich was coming from Athens to Lithuania. And when you fly back then from Athens to Lithuania, you would pass Belarus if you fly directly. Uh, and for Lukashenko, somehow he, he got this awesome idea, or maybe his KGB, or maybe his analyst, or maybe his fucking dog got this idea, hey, let's arrest this guy. Although his main like enemy, Tikhanovska, was actually flying the same flight the day before, which they didn't do um, any kind of arrest, but they decided that they're going to do him like they're going to arrest him. And what happened was this idea with the bomb and then Belarusian state trying to play this stupid face with, oh, this was actually organized by the uh, Palestinian Liberation Army or um, no, they were saying it was done by Hamas and they showed the email and stuff. And for them, it was, I think, from one side, this kind of like, oh, we are going to show all the opposition that we have control over your body, over your freedom, and we can snatch you at any point we want. But at the same time, what they did here is that they actually attacked the power of the European Union in, in the politics, right, in the world politics, because the Ryanair is part of the well, European influence, European property, let's say like that. And um, that arrest pushed quite a lot of action from the European Union, like the, the biggest sanctions and the biggest pressure uh, that started happening, ha started happening actually after this airplane action of Lukashenko's. And this was, this is not something that happens quite a lot. I think this was the first and only time when Lukashenko did this kind of crazy action. But they are trying to use the, um, for example, Interpol databases quite often to get the people back or to try to build up pressure. And that was what's happening as well with the case of an anarchist from Belarus, Bolinkov, about whom Maria will be talking. All right, but uh, don't you want to mention the consequences of this uh, downing of the plane? In the sense, what happened to Protasevich, you mean? No, no, like in general for the country politically. It just started, like, it basically was the beginning of all the sanctions that were imposed and also uh, prohibition on flights from European countries and to European countries. So basically at the moment you can't fly out of Belarus I think, apart from Russia or like Kazakhstan, something like that. And all the tourist planes have to like make a curve 
around Belarus to even go there or land there. Yeah, so I think uh, if we speak about like anarchists who are persecuted by the state, so in Belarus uh, at the moment, a lot of anarchists uh, have been arrested be because of some prior actions or their prior affiliations, let's say. So only a few anarchists were arrested just after the protests and in connection with the protests. And there's a case of like an international anarchist criminal organization. And in, it's international because they have found like one anarchist organization. It's called Revolutionary Action that existed in Belarus. Then I think they opened like a chapter in Ukraine. And they also like put their ABC Belarus is also like part of this network, according to the police, because the anarchist Black Cross like is supposed to kind of finance all this criminal activity. And uh, basically, pr probably providing solidarity means financial cr financing criminal activity. And uh, basically what happened is that they uh, arrested a few uh, groups of people in different cities and uh, at the moment, they're all like put under one big case of this criminal organization. Uh, and they face, I think, like up to 10, 12 years. I don't remember exactly. And they are accused of participating in anarchist actions in previous years. So like not really connected with the protest. So but but they just use the protest and they use the like the momentum of repression to persecute everyone who could be at some point active in anything in the future. And Alexei Bolenkov was also, like, cops also issued a list. I think it was like 25 person list with names of people who are potentially involved in this case or need to be questions as witnesses. And Bolenkov was one of them. And basically, he lived in Ukraine for like seven years now. And basically the uh, local security services came to him and tried to give him the special document they, that they issued, like not the court, but they just issued it inside their office, uh, saying that he ha has to leave the country. So they didn't really extradit him, but they, it was clear that they have like cooperation with the security service in Belarus and they don't want this kind of person in, in Ukraine. So they offered him to just leave the country voluntarily. And what he did, he like, basically now he's been like trying to appeal it for four months. Recently, he got the court decision uh, that didn't, up, didn't uphold this order. So he can't stay in Ukraine, but the cops appealed again. So now he's gonna go to the Supreme Court and so the case is not closed. And here we see, like when I was talking previously about safety of Ukraine, let's say, for uh, people who flee the country, it is safe as long as you're like not an anarchist or like not uh, someone who is also being persecuted by the uh, Ukrainian state. So I think the example of Belenkov like is uh, is clear about that and um, yeah so this is basically how instrumental can be this cooperation between different security services and that you can't really run away from the state can't really run away from the capitalism or like from cops watch or whatever so yeah I'm not sure how the case is gonna end because the pressure from the NGOs and like all this kind of concerned public this is not useful for the Ukrainian police so probably he's gonna stay but anyway like uh, I wouldn't imagine my life if I was a uh, Bolenkov like it would be really weird to just continue living somewhere where you know the services are interested in you and like like following you and following what you're doing so it's uh, it's a bit hard and also, like you said, about the other examples, I was already mentioning a few examples of arresting people in Moscow and Russia. So that's like uh, kind of uh, the clenches of the regime are there. Uh, and one of uh, breast and like anti-fascist from a regional city, he he was persecuted in, in Belarus for mass riots and he ran away to Moscow. 
and now he's in he's in jail for like half a year and uh, he, the decision was to extradite him but uh, his lawyer appealed to the European Court of Human Rights and the court said that Russia can't do that because he has like he can face like threats to life or health so basically for the moment he still is in Moscow but uh, we don't know like what happens because Russia can also disobey and uh, doesn't give a shit about this uh, European court decisions. Please correct me if I'm wrong about this, but I, um, I think I recall that last year, I want to say in July, the administration released a bunch of longstanding political prisoners that they were that they were holding on to. Um, when you said last year, July, I think you mixing it up uh, with like t- 2015. So like uh, there were a lot of people arrested in 2010 anarchist included, and also people who protested the 2010 uh, presidential elections. And back then, like, the last pack of people was uh, pardoned, let's say, in 2015, including uh, Mikolai Zedok and uh, Igor Alinevich, who are anarchists and who are in jail again this uh, this time. They were arrested in uh, November last year. Um, so basically, uh, what's happening now, just to mention the pardoning tendencies, uh, Lukashenko is trying to do it again. Uh, although it's really, it happens really weird because, uh, what's happening is that he has like a person who, uh, was previously a political prisoner, uh, and, uh, then he was set free probably on, uh, the pretext of cooperation. So now he has formed like a kind of a party or a movement for like democratic change or something like that. And he his organization is sending out letters to all the political prisoners and asking them to write a petition for mercy. And uh, some people do. Uh, and I know, I think there's now about 20 people who has been pardoned starting from March. But uh, either... It means that not so many political prisoners are actually writing these petitions for mercy, or it means that uh, not all of them get pardoned. And um, getting back to prisoners that ABC supports, so at the moment, like I said, there's a, the the group of uh, the International Criminal Organization that's around like uh, nine people, I, I think. Four people from that is called like anarcho partisans. These are people who were arrested in the forests uh, on the border between Belarus and Ukraine, and uh, they are accused of setting fire on cops' cars or some prosecutors' offices uh, or police stations in the region, in the provinces. And uh, Mikola the dog, which he he turned uh, out to be a blogger recently. So like he was like having his like anarchist. YouTube channel or something, and he was uh, he decided to stay in the country, and he was arrested in a safe flat, which was supposed to, like so they found him by surveillance cameras and face recognition system, and there's like a few groups of uh, former football hooligans of like the anti-fascist football club that were also participating in. Uh, mass riots or attacking cops and stuff like that. So like there are some more individual people who were arrested like really recently because in uh, late July and uh, August cops actually attacked like everyone they had on the list or everybody who was even like in contact with anarchists. And some of the people who were arrested, they were arrested for 15 or 30 days, uh, but some actually got uh, criminally charged for just being in the streets, uh, participating in marches, not really like mass riots, but just uh, having a picture of you standing on the roadway is already like blocking the traffic or something like that. I think this these are people who now come to my mind, but uh, like I said, it's about like it's a little bit less than thirty people now and and just to mention it there's let's say up to uh, four thousand people that the prosecution reports about as being prosecuted for mass riots or for uh, offending the state, offending the president, offending cops online, and so on. And a little bit over 1,000 of them are behind bars. 
So among them are 30 anarchists and anti-fascists. And if you realize that the anarchist movement is not so big in the country, uh, the anti-fascist movement doesn't really exist as a movement. So there's like uh, pieces of uh, some groups that leftovers of like this Antifa hooligan scene, let's say, who are not like really organized. And uh, we're speaking here about like 300 500 people max, like who are just affiliating themselves with the ideas. And having like 30 of them behind bars out of this number, and like 1,000 of millions of Belarusians who were protesting, means that like basically our part of the movement got repressed quite a lot, like uh, if we speak about like percentage. Can you talk about the upcoming crowdfunding to um, that? that ABC Belarus is going to be enacting and sort of what what the fund, how much funds are needed, where the money would be going and how people can get involved in supporting that. Right. So basically, like I said previously, we are trying to help people financially in the first place with legal fees and care packages to prison, but also with uh, paying for therapy sessions or uh, providing money for people who have spent like a month in jail for example but they couldn't work and but they have to still pay for uh, their flat or people who have migrated and uh, need some support at least in the first like three to six months and that's a lot of people and uh, we don't really receive a lot of donations in belarus because uh, there's almost <laughs> no one left Everybody's either in jail or outside of the country, and also we don't have like uh, it's it's not safe to have uh, like a personal account where people could donate in uh, Belarus. So most of our donation channels are like electronic wallets or like Bitcoin, PayPal, or European bank accounts, which is not like really useful for people in Belarus because. Uh, PayPal doesn't work there, and European bank account would require like a lot of fees. So most of our donations are coming from abroad, and each case costs us like around five thousand euros or like okay six seven thousand dollars. And and these are ongoing. Like people are going to stay in jail for like five to ten years. I mean, if if nothing changes, and uh, in order to provide assistance. Like on 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 ongoing basis, like I think we once a year we're like putting a, like big crowdfunding campaign and trying to attract funds. So it would be really cool if people could spread it. And uh, I think the link is going to appear like somewhere um, in the description to this episode. Yeah, so it would be really cool if you could spread the word uh, because this is something we really need now. Were there any other things that you wanted to say before we ended this interview? Um, maybe I just wanted to mention that it does sound like a failure. And I think it, it is a failure in a way if we just think about it as a like that the aim was to uh, change the regime, let's say. But uh, for me, as a participant of uh, all these process of uh, transformation um, of the society that used to be like totally apolitical and totally not interested, also a little bit anti-anarchist, let's say, I saw a lot of uh, good things about it. And I think actually... I'm happy that it didn't change in like a month that people just uh, uh, have another president now and think they live in democracy. I think it's uh, perfect that people had to go through this process. Of course, it's painful for them and it like maybe doesn't make sense for many of them. But uh, in general, it feels that the next time when something like this happens, and it will happen at some point, we've got like a lot of people in the country with experience, with anger, and uh, with probably not so much illusions about the peaceful protests or whatever. And uh, also people who have experienced solidarity, who have organized solidarity by themselves, or who like got to know their neighbors just because of the protest, tried some kind of self-organizing methods and and so on. And like, especially now they got like really interested in uh, not really anarchist ideas, I would say, but in 
like anarchists became uh, people that everybody likes, let's say, without knowing what exactly they are doing. But uh, I think the anarchist movement got like this kind of credit of trust. And I think it's important for us. And I think for me, what is also important is that for a lot of people in so-called first world, anarchism is some kind of an abstraction that maybe leads to some bizarre utopia, uh, but it doesn't have connections to the reality. Uh, while for us in the East, it is like a reality. We are not just, you know, fighting for some utopia on some island or on some other planet, but rather like we're trying to push the anarchist revolutionary ideas towards the society and the moment that we had in 2020 was the moment when the society was transforming as well under the anarchist influence and under anarchist ideas of like horizontal organizing and and self-organizing in the neighborhood assemblies and so on and so forth so it is really important to remember that we are not standing for something that will never happen, rather that we are standing for a revolutionary transformation of society that will happen if we are believe in that, if we are fighting strong enough. And Belarus is still fighting, and we hope that we will, well, destroy the fuckers regime. And we'll live not only in a beautiful new president republic, but rather live in the country that is giving an example to the rest of the world how to be free, how to organize, how to smash the authoritarianism. Thank you, Maria and Vasily, both for participating in this conversation and sharing your experiences and your perspectives. And um, I look forward to sharing this with the audience. And now here are some words from anarchist prisoner Sean Swain. We're in another election cycle, and the campaign ads are flooding the airwaves. A common theme in many of them, on the Republican side especially, is to condemn opponents for supporting the movement to defund the police. These ads are so pervasive. It makes me think that the Republicans know something in terms of polling data and test groups and town hall surveys, something that indicates that voters oppose defunding police. It would seem that Republican strategists are convinced that most folks are afraid and suspicious of anyone who espouses a program to defund the police. This is kind of curious. It's curious because it seems that we have a situation where Americans are both really in favor of defunding police, while at the same time really opposed to defunding police. What I mean is, if questioned one way, most Americans are very enthusiastic about defunding police. If you ask Americans whether they want the local police force to have MRAPs and Humvees and 50 caliber machine guns, most of them don't want that at all. If you ask them if they would prefer that police operate more efficiently, like, for example, firefighters who stay on call at the station rather than patrolling streets looking for fires, people want those kinds of reforms. And rightfully so. It makes no sense to have cops driving around and burning gas, looking for crimes happening out in the open. No sense at all. You might as well have fire trucks patrolling around with firefighters looking for smoke or send ambulances patrolling around looking for heart attacks. If you ask people if government should hire more experts and psychologists to help them respond to domestic situations and increasing the number of crisis intervention scenarios rather than sending cops with guns and no training, everyone would prefer the experts. Everyone would shift the paycheck from the cop to the shrink. In fact, the real actual agenda of the in fact, the real actual agenda of defunding the police is perhaps universally applauded. There is great consensus for each of the itemized points of the defund police program. What I'm saying is when voters don't know that what they're supporting is the defund police agenda, they are enthusiastic about it, 
But after supporting each line item of the agenda, when voters are asked what they think of defunding the police, they're overwhelmingly and enthusiastically opposed. They hate it. In fact, anyone proposing such an agenda is a criminal and a traitor. I think this contradiction tells us something about how people form opinions. And it tells us something about voters and electoral politics as well. First, people are stupid. All of us. We think we're the smartest species on the planet. It takes a species this smart to have the potential to kill all life on the planet. No other species can do that. But what's smart about wiping yourself out? That sounds pretty stupid. Nobody has to explain that to salmon or timber wolves or butterflies. Just humans. So, we're dumb. And this defund police contradiction gives us a sense of how we think. When discussing detailed policy proposals, we have the ability to analyze the pros and the cons thoughtfully. But when confronted with a phrase that's loaded, a soundbite that carries a whole package of assumptions attached to it, we form an opinion thoughtlessly, and sometimes form a thoughtless opinion that directly contradicts how we really feel about the actual substance of the thing. Here's what I mean. For decades, Americans hated and feared socialism. Socialism meant the tyranny of the Soviet Russian government, a war against religious freedom, oppression, invasion, colonization, and nefarious plots to take over the world. Socialism was evil. What about public schools? Love them. Social Security, most popular government program ever. Union wages, general support. Public utilities, fantastic. The Postal Service, most effective government system ever devised in human history. All of those programs are socialist. They're all socialist in character, and everyone supports them. Ask about any of those, and you hear favorable things. Ask them how they feel about socialism, however, and they'll tell you how evil it is. So, politicians and parties pull bait and switches. They talk about the evils of socialism, of crime, of terrorism. They use the loaded soundbite words to get a visceral emotional reaction, and we then throw our thoughtless support to an agenda we don't really understand. That's how we got tough on crime laws. That, when first applied, resulted in the life sentence for some idiot who stole a pizza. Or how we got draconian surveillance laws that let the government spy on all of us all the time and treat thoughtful dissent as terror. Loaded soundbite words, like defund police. We have stupidity and intellectual laziness on the part of the voters and politicians who are corrupt, dishonest opportunists. So when it comes to elections, I can't help but think that all of the hierarch arguments against letting everyone run their own lives without government apply here. If we're too stupid, lazy, corrupt, and dishonest to govern ourselves without a government, aren't we too stupid, lazy, corrupt, and dishonest to choose candidates or to be candidates? So... In this campaign, with the smearing of defund the police, let's not forget, democracy starts with duh. This is Anarchist Prisoner Sean Swain, an exile from Ohio at Buckingham Correctional in Dillwyn, Virginia. If you're listening, you are the resistance. You can write to Sean Swain by addressing letters to Sean Swain, number 201-5638, Buckingham Correctional Center, P.O. Box 630, Dillwyn, Virginia, 23936. You can find his past writings, recordings of his audio segments, and updates on his case at seanswain.org, or now follow him on Twitter at at Swain Rocks. This is The Final Straw, and I'm Bursa Goodness. This show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at The Final Straw Radio, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 
888-888-2816. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned co-op in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a catalog of Firestorm's books and zines, plus a full calendar of events up at their website, firestorm.coop.